So first off, I've, I'm, I'm happy to see that Dr. Hatch is here because today is National Signing Day for the recruits. And I thought he'd maybe, re, you know, researching what Utah is signing this year. The recruiting class doesn't look to be super great, but <laughs> I think we're ranked like 70th right now. We were, it's, it's a down year for us. But anyways, uh, our next pre presenter is Marilyn McCaskin. She's also a PGY3 neurology resident. And like when we do our neuro-ophthalmology rotation, we have to do a certain number of grand rounds and presentations. They will hunt you down no matter if you're <laughs> ophthalmology or neurology. She's finished her neuro, neuro op rotation a month ago, or a couple <laughs> months ago. They hunted her down to come back. So <laughs> she's gonna present chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. So yeah, I'm talking about um, chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. Um, this also is a patient that I saw with Dr. Warner. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about our case and then um, talk about the disease a little bit and then we'll just return to our case to see uh, kind of where he is now. So our patient is a 48-year-old uh, man. Um, he presented um, a little over six months ago with right um, eye pain that was worse with eye movement. And that was followed shortly thereafter by complete vision loss in his right eye. Um, on review of systems, he had a little bit of fatigue, but otherwise, that was about it. Um, history of hypothyroidism and depression. He's had a couple of surgeries in the past. Um, nothing too remarkable on his social history. Um, in his family history, his uh, mother had hypothyroidism, so maybe a little bit of autoimmunity um, and pancreatic cancer, and um, father just had hypertension. Um, on his physical exam at his initial presentation, his uh, visual acuity in his right eye was hand motion, but normal on the left. Um, he had a very slightly elevated intraocular pressure on the right, um, normal on the left. He did have an afferent pupillary defect on his right eye. Um, extraocular movements were uh, slightly limited just by pain, but otherwise were um, intact. Um, he had impaired color vision on the right eye. Um, and then on his um, anterior segment exam, he just had some mild blepharitis, um, maybe some trace cataracts. But then on his dilated fundoscopic exam, he did have some edema of the optic nerve on the right. Uh, these are his visual fields from when he first presented. And you can see that in his left eye, it um, looks pretty normal, but almost completely obliterated there on the right. And this is his initial MRI. And uh, this is a contrast-enhanced MRI. And you can see there on the coronal view that on the right he has enhancement of his optic nerve, whereas we don't see that enhancement on the left eye. And you can see the same thing on the axial view there. Um, and then, um, I mean, I don't have images looking at the rest of the brain, but the rest of his brain looks normal. So we had a pretty extensive laboratory workup um, that was mostly unremarkable. Um, BMP and CBC were normal. Um, he had aquaporin-4 antibodies tested looking for NMO, and those were negative. Um, uh, they tested an ACE level looking for sarcoidosis, which was normal. Um, ANA was not detected. Lysozyme was normal. RPR was non-reactive. ESR was normal. And he also had West Nile virus um, titers that were negative. He um, had a lumbar puncture and his uh, CSF was normal. Um, and he has a couple of labs that are pending right now, um, uh, testing for optic nerve antibodies, as well as CRMC5 antibodies, which are part of a, a perineoplastic syndrome that can affect the optic nerve. And then he also had a chest x-ray, um, again looking for uh, changes that would suggest sarcoidosis, and that was also normal. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, like I said, his labs and imaging were um, pretty unrevealing except for that optic nerve um, enhancement. So at this point, um, he really just has an isolated optic neuritis. He was treated then um, after his, this episode with um, methylprednisolone um, infusions for three days followed by oral prednisone that was tapered over time. And um, with that, his pain resolved and his vision um, improved almost back to normal in that right eye. 
However, over the course of the next six months, he had two relapses of optic neuritis on his uh, left eye and another relapse on the right eye. Uh, with each relapse, he was treated again with another IV uh, uh, course of steroids, um, and his vision, um, again, would return to, to normal or almost normal. Um, each uh, course of IV steroids was followed by oral prednisone, which was tapered over time. And um, it was noted that every time he uh, would taper his oral prednisone down to either like zero to, to maybe about five milligrams daily is when he would have another relapse. Um, and this just shows his visual fields on one of his return visits. And you can see that the right eye, which was the one that was initially affected, is almost uh, returned to normal. And now the left eye um, is affected. So at this point, with so many relapses, he can be considered to have chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. Uh, this is a, a really rare disease, and it's actually um, pretty new to the literature. Um, so we've known about optic neuritis for a long time, and we've known that it can be a, its own isolated event, or it can eventually over time progress to multiple sclerosis or NMO, or it can be part of another systemic disease, um, like many of the things that this patient was tested for. But um, in some instances, we don't find any other disease, and, and these patients can just have relapses of optic neuritis, and that's when they get the diagnosis of um, cryon. Um, so this was first described in 2003, so it, it hasn't really been um, around for that long, or at least that we've known about. Um, in 2004, the NMO antibody was um, first described, or first uh, discovered, I guess. And so at first people were saying, well, maybe cryon is part of NMO. Um, but as this was studied more, it was found that these are really pretty separate entities. 95% um, uh, of patients who present with optic neuritis are negative uh, for the NMO antibody. And um, we also know that uh, these diseases have different mechanisms of action. And um, with NMO, there's a complement activation that causes astrocytic necrosis. Um, and there's a, a GFAP biomarker that you can use to detect this process, and that is not detected in cryon. So that um, kind of helps to distinguish the two diseases as well. Um, so <coughs> Petzl and Plant uh, recently published a review of all of the 122 cases that have been reported in the literature since 2003. Um, so, re so really not something that we see very often, but from their review, they found that um, patients aged, uh, or were um, aged anywhere from 14 to 69 years old with a mean of about 35 years. Um, probably a little bit more prevalent in um, females, although in 32% of the cases the gender wasn't reported, so it's hard to know exactly. Um, the etiology is uh, certainly not understood, although it is thought to be some kind of autoimmune process because these patients do respond really well to immunosuppressive therapies. Um, but we don't have any biomarkers um, for this disease like we do, like for example the NMO antibody that we have with NMO. Um, so these patients present with um, either monocular or bilateral vision loss, uh, which is usually severe, like we saw in our patient. Um, the, the course of the disease and the prognosis is a little bit difficult to, to know right now with only, you know, a few cases in the literature and uh, very uh, uh, variable time of follow-up with each of those um, cases. But the, the authors um, note that in their experience, the disease activity can settle over a decade or so. Um, uh, anywhere from two to 18 episodes of relapse have been reported, although, um, again, it's hard to know because there's um, kind of a variety of um, lengths of follow-up. Um, and most people do present with pain um, with their vision loss, like uh, we would see with a typical optic neuritis. So um, when we evaluate these patients um, with optic neuritis, the um, differential is pretty broad. Um, usually these patients should get an MRI of their orbits and brain as well as the spinal cord with and without contrast. Um, for cryon, uh, you should see optic nerve enhancement, um, but the MRI can also look for evidence of demyelinating lesions, which could make you think that maybe this is actually N MS or NMO or some kind of compressive lesion affecting the optic nerve. Um, but for, for cryon, there really shouldn't be any other MRI abnormalities that would explain the patient's symptoms. 
um, these patients should get an, an NMO antibody tested and um, usually should be negative, although approximately 5% of cases of cryon in the literature have a positive NMO antibody, which makes things a little bit confusing. But um, also on the differential is um, ischemic optic neuropathy, and you could think about this in somebody who has vascular risk factors. Um, maybe think about a temporal artery biopsy if you're worried about um, GCA. Um, in someone with a family history, you could think about a uh, hereditary optic neuropathy. And then um, testing for any of the systemic diseases that can cause optic neuritis, um, like uh, diabetic papillitis, um, any of the um, toxicities or nutritional defi deficiencies that can cause this. Um, there are several infections, other um, autoimmune or inflammatory diseases like lupus. Um, the um, authors of the Petzl and Plant um, paper that uh, the review of all of these cases, they um, stress that they, they don't think that a lumbar puncture is needed to make this diagnosis. Um, although, of course, it can be helpful if you have any reason to suspect um, MS or an infectious cause um, that, you know, a CSF analysis could help to differentiate. So the treatment can be broken down into three phases. Um, in the acute phase, um, your goal is to restore the lost vision. And um, most people have used um, solumetrol um, or, or methylprednisolone um, for this. You can also use plasmapheresis. Um, once you've done that, you uh, want to stabilize the vision, um, and uh, this uh, has usually been done with oral steroids. Um, the, the authors of this review paper suggest um, using prednisone, uh, one mg per kg per day, and then gradually tapering over time. Um, some patients are able to be tapered off of prednisone completely, but others um, will require oral um, steroids chronically in order to prevent relapses. And then in the long term, um, finding a um, uh, immunomodulatory therapy that um, can allow the patient to come off of steroids is um, ideal, and a variety of things have been used for this, even um, IVIG and plasmapheresis. So um, these um, authors uh, proposed a set of diagnostic criteria for cryon. Um, so they suggest that um, any, uh, in the history, someone would have to have um, optic neuritis with at least one relapse. Um, they would have to have objective evidence for loss of visual function. Uh, they should have a negative NMO antibody, ideally. Um, MRI should show contrast enhancement of um, the optic nerve, and um, these patients should respond to immunosuppressive therapies. So to follow up on our patient, um, when he was last seen, I, I think in January, his um, vision in his right eye uh, was 2040, um, but 2020 on the left. Um, and recently, he's been started on methotrexate um, in hopes to, to hopefully get him off of steroids. Um, he had a, a recent MRI um, with maybe some faint optic nerve enhancement, but you can see um, here, uh, this is his MRI, both optic nerves um, uh, look uh, pretty good or at least closer to normal than his first MRI did. So um, I think that's it. <laughs>
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you.
thank you.